Hello, this is Walter Mack, and today we will be discussing a brief approach to wrist MRI. So the, the wrist can be quite complex. There are a lot of um, little structures that are very difficult to see on routine MRI. So I'd like to start by um, analyzing the more difficult structures first and then work my way towards the more the easier structures or the structures that are somewhat analogous to what you've encountered in the other joints. But that's only my own preference and I continue to uh, suggest a structure-based approach. Uh, particularly in the wrist it may actually be more advantageous to adopt a regional approach. Uh, for example, you may see requisitions where the clinician kindly actually directs you to you know, the site of pain, whether it's radial sided, ulnar sided, dorsal, volar, so on and so forth. But this is the approach I'm used to. Uh, I'm not saying that you should always adapt this approach. You should find an approach that's comfortable for you and uh, stick with it to ensure a comprehensive interpretation every time. So I usually start with the TFCC, the triangular fiber cartilage uh, complex. And the TFCC is composed of several components. Uh, there is the TFC articular disc, which is this biconcave disc here. Okay, And then as I scroll very volarly and dorsally, in this case dorsally, you will start cutting into the dorsal radial ulnar ligament and the volar radial ulnar ligament. So when we're scrolling through these images, how do we know whether we're in the TFC articular disc or whether we're in one of the radial ulnar ligaments? Well, for one, as I had mentioned, the TFC articular disc is biconcave, and it also attaches to a thin rim of cartilage on the radial aspect. Where So that's this increased signal right here. Whereas the volar and dorsal radial ulnar ligaments attach directly to bone and have a more rectangular appearance, as you can see here and this now the volar radial ulnar ligament. Uh, going back to the TFC articular disc for a second, I just want to really highlight the importance of scrutinizing both the foveal attachment, okay, that's this guy here, foveal attachment, and the styloid attachments of the TFC articular disc. In particular, partial tears involving the foveal attachment, that's this guy sitting and attaching right here in the fovea of the distal ulna may be associated with the distal ulna joint instability. So although it just a partial tear can be of, uh, of um, clinical and ultimately surgical importance, whereas disruptions of the styloid attachment of the TFC are less often associated with the distal ulna joint instability. Some would include the lunotricuture ligament with the TFCC articular um, TFCC complex, but I tend to analyze that separately. I want to point out that as we move towards the ulnar side of the wrist, there is typically a heterogeneous region here, which is predominantly fibrovascular tissue. And I just want to point this out because you'll very commonly see intermediate signal, um, intermediate to high signal in this region, and not to necessarily call that pathology. Then there's the extensor carpi ulnaris, which again I'll touch upon uh, briefly later when I talk about tendons, as well as this uh, term that's somewhat nebulous known as the meniscus homologue. Some individuals such as myself like to lump the meniscus homologue with the ECU and consider part of the ECU subsheath, and a uh, similar thought process applies with the quote-unquote ulnar collateral ligaments. Some like to regard that as a separate structure, whereas I prefer to consider that, that as part of the extensor carpi ulnaris subsheath. The ECU, again, we will be discussing later. If we scroll to the far um, volar aspect of the chrono data set, you may see two additional ligaments here admittedly not well shown one coming off the volar the volar radial ulnar ligament going to the lunate that's the ulnar lunate ligament another ligament coming off that volar radial ulnar ligament and then going to the triquetrum that's the ulnar triquetral ligament and sometimes we can see these on sagittal so this if you can follow my localizer this it would be the approximate location of the ulnar triquetral ligament and we scroll more radially in this area here would be where I would expect to see the ulnar lunate ligament. Thankfully um, injuries involving these structures are fairly uncommon so for now I wouldn't worry too too much about um, uh, 
those structures. So TFCC lesions can be broadly classified into either traumatic injuries and degenerative injuries. Traumatic injuries are really classified based on location. So um, it's important to, if you see a TFCC tear, obviously, is it a full thickness perforation or is it a partial thickness tear? Um, and then is it involving the central part of the articular disc? And by central, we don't necessarily mean the geometric center of the articular disc, just as long as it's not involving the far peripheral attachments or the radio attachments, then I would consider that a central perforation. I also want to caution you that uh, as an isolated, finding central perforations of the TFC articular disc are quite prevalent in the normal population, especially with increasing age. So if that is the only finding you see, I would be careful about trying to ascribe any clinical significance to it necessarily. As a secondary finding, you may see fluid in the distal ulnar joint. We actually do see a trace of fluid in the distal radial ulnar joint here, but when there's copious fluid, then that really invites us to go back and look again at the TFCC to uh, ensure we haven't overlooked the TFCC uh, tear. Uh, before I forget, I just want to point out that sometimes you can actually see the TFC articular disc in Kamois fairly well in Sagio. It seems somewhat counterintuitive to think that, but here is the um, the TFC articular disc. Again, note the biconcave morphology, and it's almost like looking at the body of a, of, of a knee meniscus, and then at the very margins we we can actually appreciate the dorsal and the volar radial under ligaments as well. And you can just go back and forth and ensure that there are no communicating defects. Uh, some of you may wonder about the role of uh, MR arthrography or CT arthrography. And the, I think as of right now, uh, the, it appears that most lesions can be picked up on a high quality non-arthrographic MRI. However, I do want to point out that the literature would support performing CT or MR arthrography for detecting um, partial thickness tears, which may be occult at MR arthrography, sorry, at plain MRI. Um, and in particular, like I mentioned earlier, those that involve the foveal attachment of the TFCC are um, notoriously difficult to pick up on a plain MRI, but more readily appreciated when we put uh, gadolinium or iodine in contrast, not only in the radiocarpal joint, but also if there's no communication into the distal uh, radio ulnar joint, a uh, separate distal radio ulnar joint uh, injection may show that partial tear. Okay, so if it's not a central perforation of the TFC, then we may be dealing with a peripheral uh, disruption of the TFC, and if so, again, we should scrutinize the foveal and stylate components separately and report on which of those components are disrupted, if, or if both are disrupted. Um, the very rare ulnolunate or ulnotricrucial ligament evulsion, I think I'll just disregard for now, but just, just so you know that, be aware that there is such a lesion, but those are rare. And then finally, you may actually get evulsion of the TFC articular disc from the radio attachment, and um, you might even see a fleck of bone disrupted off as well. And so this is also associated with instability, so it's an important uh, finding to note. And of course, if there is a disruption of either the dorsal or volar radial ulnar ligament, that should be noted. The degenerative um, category of lesions is basically the spectrum of findings which ultimately leads to uh, ulnar abutment. As you know, this is a condition that is seen in patients who have ulnar positive variants, so that's where your ulnar head kind of extends distal to the distal radial articular surface here. Um, and the cascade of findings go from really just partial thickness tearing or thinning of the TFC articular disc to that finding with chondrosis of the proximal lunate, proximal tricuitrum on their head. All right, so assessing the cartilage is important as well. And then eventually um, complete tears of the TFC and then all the previous findings with a lunar tracuitral ligament tear, which we'll discuss later, and finally all those buff findings and the associated findings of ulnocarpal arthritis, frank osteoarthritis, where now we're seeing cysts and osteophytes and subconscious sclerosis, something that I think would be readily plain film apparent. So having scrutinized the TFCC uh, complex, we then shift gears and look at the scaphalunate ligament. This is one of the major interosseous ligaments and is a not uncommon indication for wrist MRI. So let me try to um, get this in view here. So the um, 
scaphalunate ligament has three components. It has a membranous component, which is right here. And if I scroll dorsally, there's this striated band here. This is the dorsal band. And if I scroll the other way, um, we will see the volar band. The volar band is a little harder to see because it's obliquely oriented. This is the approximate location of the volar band. Um, here's the membranous portion again. And it's really the dorsal band that you should focus most of your attention on because this is the strongest component of the scaphalinic ligament. And it's the component that confers stability to the scaphalinic articulation. Um, here are the ligaments, ligament components on axis. So basically what you do is you just kind of find your radius and then you slowly scroll distally. Here's our lunate and then here's our scaphoid. And as you scroll along, you will eventually cut into the dorsal band of the um, scaphalinic ligament. Oh, this is quite grainy. Let me see if I can just make it a little less so. So it's these fibers here. So in the very early papers describing uh, scaphalinic ligament on wrist MRI, they would probably show coronals about there. And unfortunately, this really only cuts through the membranous portion. And analyzing only the membranous portion is fraught with peril because, number one, it's not a key contributor to stability to the scaphalinic ligament. Number two, uh, just like the TFC articular disc, central perforations of the um, membranous portion of the scaphalinic ligament are quite prevalent. Moreover, uh, the early papers also described a myriad of normal appearances, including various patterns of increased signal within the membranous portion, which were all ultimately considered normal findings. So I think it's difficult to analyze the membranous portion. Thankfully, um, our attention really should be directed to that dorsal band. So if we do look on the coronals, um, as I think I've implied with my earlier scrolling, we actually have to look quite further than just this kind of proximal aspect of the scaphalinate interval. We have to look quite distal, and this all here is dorsal band. If you were to look at the scaphal or the proximal couple row from the side, for example, you would see that the dorsal band is kind of like one arm of a big U. This is the bottom of the U, the membranous portion, and we scroll to the roller side. This is the other um, part of the U. Okay, so keep that morphology in mind as you look at these images. And then ditto for, for the axial. So if we want to find and analyze the dorsal and volar bands, we have to re remember to scroll diligently through the full length of the scaphalunic or uh, ligament dorsal band or volar band, uh, whichever uh, structure you happen to be uh, interrogating at the time. So I like to describe the scaphalunate ligament actually as three kind of subcomponents if you want to describe each component separately. Uh, herein lies the uh, disadvantage of doing a conventional arthrogram because if you s if let's say you inject the midcarpal joint here okay and you see contrast spillage into the metacarpal joint that's fine you know that there's a perforation somewhere in the scaphalinate ligament but you don't know which component is involved and you don't know if multiple components are involved or just a single component is involved and of course if it's the membranous portion it's sort of who cares and if it's the dorsal band and then there are uh, more interesting implications for stability. Uh, I just want to point out before I forget that the most common location for a ganglion cyst in the wrist is actually immediately dorsal to that dorsal band of the scaphalinic ligament and it's thought to be a sequelae of low-level repetitive microtrauma. It might imply an old injury to the underlying scaphalinic ligament as well. Uh, if you have a complete tear of the scaphalinic ligament you actually also need disruption of some of the secondary stabilizers or the extrinsic carpal ligaments to get a full-on scaphalinate dissociation and dorsal intercalated segment instability pattern which you're familiar with from your plain film analysis but I will get into the extrinsic ligaments later. Uh, parenthetically, this does again speak to the potential advantage of adopting a regional approach rather than a structure-based approach to interpretation. So we move now to the owner side and we perform a, an analogous um, uh, uh, exercise for uh, interpreting the lunotracheal ligament here. Uh, once again, just like the scaphalinate ligament, you have a dorsal band okay, between the lunate and trichrytrum, membranous portion, which is, has a myriad of norm, quote-unquote normal appearances. And then as we scroll more volarly, then we start cutting into the volar band.
if you have a 3D data set, then what you can do is, and you can do this for the escape for lunate ligament as well, is you can actually angle the um, uh, data set so that the images are parallel to either the volar or dorsal bands of whichever ligament you're looking at, and that can be helpful in um, analysis. But um, very commonly, you won't have a 3D data set, so it's important to be comfortable looking at these structures on your standard orthogonal planes. I do find the lunar tricuture ligament difficult in general, and I think it's it's just a hard structure to interpret because it's so small. So just try your best and look for secondary findings, of course. And of course, if you see extensive ligament lunotrochoidral ligament injury, then you should also uh, consider this in the context of what you had reported for the TFCC as we had described earlier. Okay, so bear with me. We were, as I said at the outset of this, we're going to go through all the all the tough stuff first and then it gets much easier. Uh, there are innumerable, um, well not innumerable, but a fair number of extrinsic carpal ligaments. These are ligaments that may attach on carpal bones or cross over the carpus, but they have attachments that are either proximal or distal to the uh, carpal bones as well. And I actually like to focus on just two on the volar side and two on the uh, dorsal side. And on the, vol let's just start with the volar side. Um, so on the volar side we have the long radial lunate or radial lunar triquedral ligament and you can see that there's a component here that goes from the radial styloid okay, uh, to the lunate so this is a volar coronal image and then there's a component that goes on to the triquedrum. I'm told that this component here, the radial lunate component, is the more um, critical component to analyze. And then immediately parallel to that is the radioscaphal capitate ligament. All right? So that also comes off the radial styloid and it comes volar to the scaphoid waist. So here's the scaphoid waist and then here's the um, RSC, radioscaphoid capitate ligament, and it will eventually attach onto the capitate right here. So I find that the chronos give us a nice overview of these extrinsic carpal ligaments, but to actually assess the ligaments, um, I favor the um, the sagittal images whenever possible. So let's just try to find these these two ligaments. So here we are, far radial sagittal image, and this is the radial styloid, okay? And we can see two black structures coming off that radial styloid. This is the radial scaphoid capitate ligament. This is the radial lunotriquedral ligament or long radial lunate ligament, all right? And both of these help secondarily stabilize the scaphoid lunate articulation. So I'm just going to scroll again from radial to ulnar side and you can see that the radial lunate ligament will attach onto the lunate, there's the lunate, and it will go onto the triquedrum. and now let's follow the radioscaphoid capitate ligament, here it is, it's crossing volar to the scaphoid waist and ultimately inserting upon the capitate as you can see here. So not too bad, and again you can call sprains, partial tears, full thickness tears as you see fit. Um, to be, truth be told, I think in most routine wrist MR interpretations, Currently, there's not an expectation, nor is it routine, to actually analyze these ligaments. Um, but like I say, theoretically, it could be important if you have a scaphoid lunate ligament injury and you're, tr you're trying to determine the potential for a developing uh, scaphoid lunate dissociation, or DISI. It has also been touted as, a, as being a possible explanation for for otherwise unexplained wrist pain. So let's say, for example, they get the wrist MRI to look for an occult scaphoid fracture, and instead you see um, disruptions of these ligaments, then although as an isolated injury they may not prompt surgical treatment, it would at least um, potentially account for, for symptoms. Um, very commonly, if you have injury to one of these ligaments, you'll have injury to the other, and that's um, not, not to be unexpected given the close proximity of these structures to one another. So now let's go to the dorsal aspect of the wrist, and on this, this data set, I apologize, it's actually hard to see the structure I'm about to talk about. So this is Lister's tubercle of the dorsal radius, and if we look very, very closely, and you have to just kind of almost take my word for it, there's a linear striated structure going across like so, and it's going to extend to the dorsum of the triquetrum. This is the dorsal radial carpal ligament. All right. And in addition to stabilizing the scaphoid lunate interval, it also stabilizes the lunar triquetral interval. And you can see that this ligament with another ligament coming around like so um, forms a V-shape. This other ligament more distally is the dorsal intercarpal ligament. And I'm going to present a, a, a simplified uh, explanation of this dorsal intercarpal ligament. Let's just say for now that it comes out the back of the scaphoid on the radial side and it goes to the back of the trichreatrum. 
All right, in truth, on the radio side, it has many more attachments, but I think for now, that should suffice for our purposes. You know, I'm just going to pull up the um, non-3D chrono just to see if we can't see these structures a little bit better. And I think it's still a challenge in this particular example that, uh, that I've pulled up. So I think what we can do next is, once again, I'd like to use the chrono as an overview to look at these structures, but then I really like to analyze the structures on the uh, sagittal. So once again, we approach Lister's tubercle. Let's focus on the dorsal side here. And as I cut across, you're going to see a ligament coming off that distal radius and eventually go to the back of the trachytrum right there. Okay, so that's right in there. And again, I'll be the very first to admit that it's a difficult, difficult analysis, especially in this example. Um, if we go to the back of the scaphoid, okay, so we expect the scaphoid attachment of the dorsal intercorporal ligament to be in this neighborhood here. Uh, we scroll uh, towards the ulnar side now. And once again, a difficult, difficult assessment, but this is where you would look. And eventually we get to the trochoetrum and there's that ligament attaching right there, all right? And of course, you can also f try to find these ligaments on the axis as well. I, I, I find this a little more, ch even more challenging than using the other planes, but perhaps you may see injuries to one or more of these ligaments only on the axle or more readily appreciated on the axle. So again, for the volar side, I would focus on the radial styloid and slowly scroll distally and then try to follow these guys as they make their way to either the lunate attachment in the case of the radial lunar trichotial ligament or the volar aspect of the capitate as you can see here. You can actually, in this case you actually can see it coming into the capitate there, the radial scaphoid capitate ligament. So again all four of these stabilizers, the RSC, um, long radial lunate or lun radial lunar trichotial ligament, dorsal radial carpal ligament, dorsal intercarpal ligament, they all contribute to scaphoid lunate interval stability and the dorsal radial carpal as well as the volar radial lunotrochoetral ligament also confer stability to the lunotrochoetral interval. Again, that's a lot of complicated terms. I don't think any of those four will thankfully show up on an OSCE. So I think if this is your first time at wrist MRI, you can actually safely disregard those for now. I think for the PGY4s and 5s and future MSK radiologists, you may have an interest in these. And so I mentioned them in this brief tutorial just for completeness sake. Okay, so we've actually now climbed to, to the top of the hill, so you, you may be quite fatigued by um, all the analysis going on so far. Now it gets really, really easy, and now a lot of what we're going to talk about is going to be very analogous to things we talked about in the other joints. So before I forget, let's just um, remind ourselves that we should always look at the articular cartilage. And here there's a lot of cartilage to look at, of course, um, but I think y you just have to have just a... Um, a brief look at the cartilage in a pl in a plane that shows it well. So sagittal and chrono for the most part will show it well. And the 3D sequences are great because the thin sections allow you to pick out uh, very small uh, chondral defects. And again, um, there may be relevance in, for example, radiocarpal chondrosis if you suspect evolving uh, post-traumatic, say, osteoarthritis. There would be uh, relevance in looking at cartilage overlaying the ulnar head and proximal lunate, proximal trichoetrum if the patient has ulnar side wrist pain or you otherwise suspect that you may be dealing with an ulnar abutment type case. All right, and just like in the elbow, I think the sagittal is a great way to look at the, the cartilages as well. All right, and the cartilage, just like in other joints, is, is assessed exactly the same way. You see that in the normal situation, it's a uh, homo fairly homogeneous intermediate signal layer. If we see signal change, we might call mild chondrosis. If we see actual defects, either less than or 50% thickness, then we'll either call grade 2 or grade 3 chondrosis respectively, or call it moderate chondrosis. When we see secondary marrow edema or cystic changes, then we are starting to describe full thickness chondral defects. Thankfully, wrist not being a wearing joint like the hip or knee, I think for the most part um, we are n not often talking about f features of primary osteoarthritis, usually secondary osteoarthritis. Okay, so now let's move along and let's talk about the flexor and extensor tendons of the wrist. And this almost for sure is going to show up 
on Onoski somewhere. Um, it tends to show up every year actually here at the University of Toronto. So I think it's worthwhile spending at least just a couple of minutes going through these compartments again uh, just to get everyone a chance to revisit this anatomy again. And once again I apologize, the, uh, not all the tendons are going to show up very well here, but it was it was difficult enough to find a, a normal, quote unquote, normal MRI to begin with. Let's start on the extensor side. I think the extensor side is challenging for many because there are six extensor compartments. Uh, before I forget to mention this later, I, I do want to point out that the extensor tendons actually don't have tendon sheaths. And uh, I'm sure I've been guilty of this before where we've called tenosynovitis of the extensor tendons. And technically, you really should use a term more like peritendinous edema, peritendinous inflammation if you see fluid or um, contrast enhancement around these extensor tendons. But that's, I think that's, that's, a, that's a bit of a, a, um, a, a finer point. So let's go on. So what's a good strategy for um, trying to remember these six extensor compartments? Uh, I like to focus on the radial three compartments first because I think there's a lot of, it's easy to mix things up here. On the ulnar side, I think it's a bit easier. Uh, that's that's just my thinking. So I think we if we use Lister's tubercle as a landmark, that's really helpful. And the first structure immediately ulnar to Lister's tubercle is the extensive pulsus longus. All right, and we remember that. And I'm going to just pause here. This is this is a memory aid that is in the old um, MSK MRI book by Kaplan De Saltz and Helms et al. So I want to give credit where credit is due. When I was a resident, I found this memory aid extremely helpful. So I'm going to propagate this but it's kudos to them for coming up with this um, this memory aid so on the other side of the Lister's tubercle you get the extensor pulsus longus tendon and you remember that because it has a longest way to go to get to the thumb all right so here it is and as we scroll distally we can see that it crosses over the second extensor compartment okay and then from then on if we go to the radial side it goes longus brevis longus brevis longus. So you've got half of the name already built in to these OSCE blanks here. If you can just remember that extensive pulsus longus is on the ulnar side of the Lister's tubercle. So now let's sh let's direct attention to the second extensive compartment. So we just said that this one here is the next one over so it's a brevis and indeed it is the extensor carpi realis brevis. Uh, it also inserts on the third metacarpal. Um, and that might that you might for, for whatever reason might find easier to remember. Its neighbor, the extensor carpi radialis longus, extent, uh, inserts onto the second metacarpal. So you might find that you remember the insertions more readily than this zany memory aid that I'm proposing right now. So extensor pollicis longus, extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor carpi radialis longus. And so now it's time for another brevis. And indeed, we are now here. Now this is really hard to see on this example. Um, this is the first extensor compartment and the next tendon over. This here is just a vessel, disregard that. Um, down here would be the extensor pollicis brevis. Not nearly as far to go to get to the thumb. Extensor pollicis brevis and finally abductor pollicis longus. All right. If you're looking at a an MRI of the distal forearm rather than the wrist, you will also be able to appreciate, in fact we might get a bit of it here, actually we do get a bit of it. This is the ex first extensor compartment crossing over that second extensor compartment. All right. So abductor pollicis longus, extensor pollicis brevis crossing over extensor carpi radialis longus and extensor carpi radialis brevis. And why am I making a, a big deal out of this, this crossing over? This is indeed where intersection syndrome happens. So because of this crossover, it's, it's prone for either or one or the other tendon group to become inflamed over with overuse. And you may see either peritendinous edema or enhancement in this region. Note that this is actually somewhat proximal to the wrist itself. Let me just get um, get one of the other sequences up just so you can appreciate how much more proximal it is. All right, you see where my localizer is. Um, if we go to the level of the wrist again, 
de Quervin's tenosynovitis is a condition that involves the first uh, extensor compartment, again, abductor pollicis, longus extensor pollicis brevis. All right, so, that, so that's half the job on the extensor side. Now let's, we have to deal with compartments 4, 5, and 6. And I think these are much easier because compartment 4 has very characteristic opinion uh, uh, appearance as multiple tendons, and it's indeed extensor digitorum. All right, uh, extensor digitorum uh, is the fourth extensor compartment immediately ulnar to extensor pulses longus, which we talked about earlier. Note that extensor digitorum will provide a contribution to the fifth digit in addition to its neighbor, uh, the fifth e extensor compartment tendon, which is extensor digiti minimi, this little guy here. And then finally, number six, extensor carpet ulnaris, we talked about briefly when we talked about. Um, the TFCC complex, once again, some people consider this part of the TFCC complex and would interpret and report this in conjunction with their TFCC analysis. And I think if you prefer to do that as well, that's fine. All right, so for compartments 4, 5, 6, we have extensor digitorum, we have extensor digitum minimi, we have extensor carpel ulnaris. All right, okay, so on the volar side, less confusing. Uh, let's start with. Uh, I suppose we can start with the carpal tunnel tendons. All right, so these are your four uh, flexor digitorum superficialis and flexor digitorum profundus tendons. So these would be the superficialis tendons. These would be your um, profundus tendons, and then you will also have flexor pollicis longus in the carpal tunnel. Then there's this other guy that kind of sneaks in under the uh, trapezium here. This is flexor carpi radialis. All right. And you can see that if we're more proximally, it's somewhat superficial relative to the other flexor tendons. And if this is FCR, flexor carpi radialis, then what's the other guy on the contralateral side? It, of course, is flexor carpi ulnaris, and it inserts onto the pisiform. You may on occasion see a, a third superficial tendon. Not everyone has one of these. And I'm just trying to see if I can even point it out here. It would be lying around here, uh, palmaris longus. All right, so if you see another very superficial tendon, superficial to the flexor tendons, that's uh, what we're dealing with. And so now, now that we've identified the tendons, now we really just read them the way we read tendons anywhere else. So if it's thickened or heterogeneous, we would call tendinosis, so we start seeing in interest substance high fluid signal, then we would start calling partial tears, and of course if there's complete discontinuity, full thickness tears, um, and um, we should also note tendon subluxation. A uh, tendon that can be quite prone to subluxation is actually the extensor carpal ulnaris tendon um, subluxing out of the uh, uh, ulnar groove here. And there is an extensor retinaculum overlying the tendon, but it provides minimal structural support to the ECU. Uh, it's important to note that if the wrist has been imaged in supination, you may see some slight physiologic uh, radial subluxation of the tendon, so just be careful. I think I won't go into how do we tell if a wrist is pronated or supinated. I think that's getting uh, into nitty-gritty details, but if you're curious, then then um, just feel free to ask. Stop me in the hall and ask me, and I'll explain to you, or chances are we'll talk about it at one readout or another anyway. Okay, so we've done the TFCC, we've done the scaphalunate ligament, we've done the lunotracutial ligament, we looked at cartilage briefly. We uh, looked at the volar and dorsal extrinsic carpal ligaments. Getting close to the finish, now I think it's worthwhile to spend maybe a minute or two talking about carpal tunnel and Guillaume's canal. All right, so carpal tunnel is fairly uh, self-explanatory. Um, you have your flexor retinaculum. Um, the tunnel uh, really begins at the low of the pisiform, and then more distally, your landmarks will be the um, the trapezial tubercle and the hook of hamate. I can just find that hook of hamate. There it is, hook of hamate, trapezial tubercle around here. And of course, the median nerve is in the carpal tunnel as well. So um, an abnormal median nerve would be enlarged. It would not show its normal physical structure. Uh, it'd be increased in signal. And of course, carpal tunnel syndrome, a clinical diagnosis, not really an imaging diagnosis, but you may be asked to assess for space occupying lesions within or near the carpal tunnel. Okay. Uh, you may have heard of Guillaume's canal, G U Y O N apostrophe S, Guillaume's canal, and that is the fibrosis tunnel through which the ulnar nerve travels. So let's try to find it here. Really should have tried to get an axial T1 sequence to show. Uh, 
to show these features better but basically you have um, I think as long as you remember that the nerve is ulnar to the nerve to the the vessels so ie the ulnar artery ulnar veins then it's much easier to pick out so this this higher signal guy here is the ulnar nerve okay and once you get to the level of the hook of hamate right in fact you can actually see it here so here here's the nerve okay and once you get to the level of the hook of hamate you're going to see the nerve bifurcate into two discrete um, sections. One is actually going to curve ulnar to the, so here's the hook of hamate. One's going to curve ulnar to the hook of hamate and that's the pure motor branch, okay? And that's, so that's zone two for those who want to follow the plastic surgery nomenclature, zone two of the ulnar nerve. This, um, this component that stays superficial to the hook of hamate is zone three or the superficial branch, all right? And so this is a pure sensory branch so again zone two is the deep motor branch and then we go proximally proximal to the bifurcation it's zone one and, and of course at that location um, you will see both motor and sensory fibers all right um, obviously the intrinsic musculature of the hand supplied by the ulnar nerve so also look for uh, muscle denervation atrophy of the intrinsic musculature if you're suspecting an ulnar nerve lesion or you see a space occupying lesion in Guillaume's canal. Um, finding the uh, the intrinsic musculature of the hand very difficult to uh, remember as well and I think as you are looking at your first few wrist MRIs I don't think it's critical to have all these m muscles memorized, you can readily look up individual muscles if you're dealing with a situation where you uh, need to know the name of a specific muscle. Okay, so now we're getting close to the end. At this point, I would start looking at the marrow edema as well. In fact, you may already have looked at that earlier on, or that may have been your first um, site of analysis, particularly if your case happens to be a rule out occult scaphoid fracture case. Um, I think you know fractures and marrow edema in this look in the wrist are treated similar to um, full side marrow edema or marrow signal abnormalities elsewhere. We do not expect to see a whole lot of red marrow in the wrist because the wrist being so peripheral to the uh, being such a peripheral part of the appendicular skeleton. I think it'd be unusual unless you had a really bad thalassemia case, but that'd be quite unusual. I think. Um, Something you might see is a so-called type 2 lunate, and that's, this patient doesn't really have it, but if you see a lunate where there's a separate facet articulating of the hamate, that's actually not a bad thing to note, uh, because patients with that configuration can have hamate lunate chondrosis, and that may actually be a cause of um, ulnar sided wrist pain. So ulnar sided wrist pain is an interesting differential, obviously. Uh, you would wonder about TFCC tears, uh, ulnar carpal abutment, uh, this kind of type 2 lunate with, um, with hamate lunate uh, chondrosis. Don't forget hook of hamate fractures. So while you're looking at your um, marrow edema, also look at the actual bones. So I've seen hook of hamate fractures missed because these tend to be a non-acute injury, usually a stress fracture in an individual who likes to golf, play tennis, or use some other um, racket or implement that they continually lever on their uh, hook of hamate. Um, you can actually get um, an accessory osco here called the os hamulus proprium and I think it's hard to distinguish between that and an old non-united non-displaced hook of hamate fracture. Keep that in mind. I had spoken earlier in the presentation about how the most common location for ganglion cysts is directly dorsal to the dorsal band of the scaphalinic ligament. The second most common location is kind of volar and radial. So in this location here, we go to the sagittal. It would be around in this location here, and it might even look like a bit of fluid uh, pooching out from the uh, radial carpal articulation. All right. Um, I really debated um, about talking about the fingers, gamekeeper's thumb, uh, cloud ligament injury, uh, the sagittal band complexes, but I think uh, most routine MRIs actually are, are focused really on the carpus, and I think when uh, we're querying gamekeeper's thumb or other uh, MCP, PIP, DIP, uh, joint abnormality or injury or flexor tendon sheath, um, injury such as a pulley injury, then that really is a whole different brand of MRI and I want to keep this um, 
tutorial in a, in a fairly digestible size. So I think we'll stop there. Again, I think of all the joints, I think wrist is the hardest. It challenges me to this very day. And I think if, like with the other joints, if we, if we just break it down to the various components and spend um, a little bit of time analyzing each component, we may find that it is not, not so bad after all. Alright, so I hope this was helpful. If you have any questions, feedback, complaints, whatever, please don't hesitate to let me know. And um, good luck. Thank you very much.